Uh, our next talk is on permissioned infrastructure and what it can do to unlock the potential of tokenization. Without further ado, uh, please welcome Graham Moore of Polymesh. Thanks, Jack. Hey, everybody. Uh, so today, I'll try to answer the question, will permissioned infrastructure unlock tokenization's potential? I think uh, to start answering that, we should go back in time. So we should go back to 2015 on permissionless Ethereum, where the ERC-20 token standard gets created. People start creating tokens like crazy, you know, these utility token things, um, different protocols and whatnot. And then eventually, people like our original team uh, at a company called Polymath started figuring out, OK, well, we can actually use this token standard or something similar to create actual financial securities, not just these utility token things. And so in 2017, our team and a bunch of other teams started creating these proprietary standards on permissionless Ethereum. Uh, we started working on that for a little while. We created the, actually the, the first point and click interface so that anyone could create a tokenized asset on Ethereum. And then in 2018, our team launched uh, ERC-1400, which is uh, an extension of ERC-20 for tokenized assets. And so we saw some pretty good uptake with ERC-1400. Uh, Consensus used it. Uh, BNP Paribas used it, uh, the government of Norway used it, and a bunch of other companies as well. But, you know, it still wasn't what we thought would happen. You know, we thought there was going to be trillions of dollars of assets. Blockchains are amazing, and they're great for the use case of financial securities. But what we realized is we were actually building on the wrong infrastructure. So we started building on Ethereum just because everyone started building on Ethereum. That's where everyone started building on smart contracts back in 2017. And so we said, okay, cool, let's use Ethereum. And so the easy analogy I like to use to explain this is, well, the internet started on phone lines just because phone lines were already in everybody's house. But then once people start using the internet, they start demanding upgrades, they start demanding faster speeds, then fiber optic cable gets laid. And so in a similar way, we're seeing a lot of similar things happening in the blockchain world today, where everyone starts building on Ethereum. It's the first place. It's where the liquidity is, where the developer resources are. But then people start building their own blockchains uh, to meet the demand and for specific use cases. So we built a purpose-built layer one public permission blockchain called Polymesh. And there are really five key pillars for why we built Polymesh. Governance, identity, compliance, confidentiality, and settlement. So governance, first one, on something like Ethereum, let's say you have a $100 million bond on Ethereum. And then the Ethereum ETH Classic fork happens, or there's another hard fork that's going to happen in a few months. Where's the real asset? Is it on fork A or fork B? Do you wait for Vitalik to tell you which is the real chain? Do you wait for exchanges to decide which is the real chain? Do you wait for staking? Uh, amounts to go to one chain or the other, and then you figure out, okay, that's the right one. Do you have to pause trading for six months while that sorts itself out? You know, so that's a huge question mark for a lot of banks and a lot of financial institutions that we talk to. Whereas on Polymesh, there's always one canonical version of the chain with on-chain governance. Then also identity is a big one. And so we were talking to banks and financial institutions for a long time, and on something like Ethereum, everyone's 0x123ABC, um, but on Polymesh, because it's public yet permissioned, Every actor on chain has to pass a KYC, uh, KYC check, and then all of the node operators on Polymesh are licensed financial entities. So they have some type of financial license, maybe broker-dealer, uh, custodian, something like that. And then compliance is a big one as well. When we were building on Ethereum, everything that we had to do for compliance, even the tokens themselves, have to be smart contracts. And so as you're building out this infrastructure, you need to have smart contracts that talk to smart contracts that talk to smart contracts, and these these transactions can get very computationally heavy, and things get very expensive, and it really doesn't scale very well. We actually hit the limits of the Ethereum gas architecture in year one of development. Uh, Ethereum right now is debating if they need to raise the limits again, because people are doing more and more complex transactions that are more and more expensive. And so on Polymesh, one of the really unique things is you can actually create an asset, manage an asset in terms of compliance rules, and trade that asset all without smart contracts. And so that makes things much more efficient, much more scalable. Then confidentiality is a big one for us. We actually have a patent pending process uh, called Mercat that we have for con confidentiality, but we'll also talk a bit more about that later in the presentation. And then finally, settlement. Um, so again, you know, I'm picking on Ethereum. You know, I like Ethereum, but Ethereum is general purpose. It's not purpose built for financial security. So there are some flaws when you get into the specific use case. And so for settlement, if I find out your address on Ethereum, you know, Solana, whatever, take your pick, I can send you any asset I want, and you can't say no. Um, so the example I always use, uh, Visa announced that they bought a CryptoPunk at one point. You know, I sent Visa assets. 
Um, a bunch of people started sending Visa assets. They started sending them NFTs with you know, illicit photos on them and whatnot. So now Visa, on their balance sheet, has NFTs of you know, people's private parts. Um, they also have a ton of unwanted, unknowable tax liabilities because Visa can't say, I don't want this transaction. Whereas on Polymesh, every single party to a transaction has to affirm settlement instructions. So party A, party B says, I want to trade. I want to trade. Only then can settlement take place. And that's just how everyone in capital markets understands things should function. But you know, Ethereum didn't think of that back in 2014 when they were creating Ethereum. Um, one really cool thing as well about Polymesh is our unique custody model. So you can actually have an account on Polymesh uh, that maintains ultimate beneficial ownership of an asset on chain while it can still designate control and custody to another party. So again, I think we're only the, the only chain in the world that has that. And so a lot of companies are embracing Polymesh. Um, you know, we have a number of KYC providers, node operators, uh, exchanges, companies that are going to deploy assets and all the services in between. Um, and highlighting a few, you know, BNP Paribas, I mentioned they use the ERC-1400 standard we created on Ethereum. We're testing Polymesh today. Uh, we also did a proof of concept with a top 10 stock exchange who issued a $100 million carbon credit. Uh, there's also smaller companies as well, not just big institutions, uh, companies like Real Estate Tokens who are close to issuing their first assets, and then Raise Finance who have a crowdfunding platform. And so really cool report, highly recommend anyone go check this out. Uh, it's by GFMA, uh, Boston Consulting Group, Clifford Chance, and Clavath, Swain, and Moore. Um, where they went through what are the best blockchains, what are the best protocols and tools to actually create tokenized assets. They only talk about six. They talk about Bitcoin, Ethereum, Corda, Corda uh, Hyperledger, and Polymesh. Um, and actually, they have one interesting part in the report where they talk specifically about public permission blockchains, which is the category that we created back when we announced that in 2019. Uh, but it's 2024. Where are the tokenized assets? You know, if you asked me back in 2017 when I started this journey, where, where are we going to be at in 2024? I'd tell you trillions of dollars of assets on chain. You know, that's where we're going to be at. But we're nowhere close to that. And I think there's a few really key reasons why. Um, the big two are that permissionless infrastructure doesn't work and smart contracts don't work. Um, so here's a really interesting part from a report by the BIS where, you know, huge quote that I have there. Don't need to read all that. The important thing to take note of is that if you have a permissionless blockchain and you have an asset on that permissionless blockchain, BIS says that can't count as a group one asset. So if it can't count as a group one asset, that means that your requirements for what you have to hold for capital are much, much higher, which sort of negates the whole point of why we're using blockchain in the first place. A lot of banks want to use blockchains because they'll increase efficiencies and they'll be much cheaper than using some uh, other infrastructure. But if you have to hold more capital to use a crypto asset, it doesn't really make sense. Um, then the second one is smart contracts don't work. Where what the BIS talks about and, and a lot of other regulators and, and whatnot talk about is how relying on third parties doesn't work for this kind of critical infrastructure. If you have billions of dollars trading on chain per day, trillions of dollars, um, if you have all those assets trading on chain, what a lot of people are doing right now is they're relying on a blockchain, such as you know, a permissionless thing like Ethereum, and then they're relying on something like a protocol that we built, ERC-1400. But ERC-1400 is just you know, some random other thing. They're not like an accountable third party that's actually managed by the bank. And so one of the big things that we've done here at Polymesh is ensuring that you actually have an API-driven blockchain that's permissioned. And so that's kind of the big thing here, you know, big takeaway, higher capital requirements and limits for group two assets make permissionless infrastructure a non-starter for institutions. And so the solution, you know, we think it's Polymesh, obviously, it's a public permission blockchain. It's a blockchain where there's native functionality for token creation, token management, token trading, and then when there's no reliance on third parties, right? Like banks, when they have that type of critical infrastructure, they wanna have one party that they're dealing with. They don't wanna have one party and then this variety of standards that could be ever changing where smart contracts can actually execute arbitrary code in their own ecosystem. And so, right, we think the solution is Polymesh, this public permission blockchain, but today we are announcing that we now have a private version of Polymesh. And so, you know, I, I want to see trillions of dollars of assets on public blockchains, but we understand banks aren't really there yet. Um, banks still want full control. They want enhanced privacy. And then one thing that's special about pri uh, Polymesh Private that we're giving them is public compatibility. So what a lot of banks and financial institutions are doing today is they're building on, you know, maybe their own type of private infrastructure or using another uh, party. But then what happens when they want to move to public infrastructure? And so 
you know, back when, back when I started this, banks pretty much said, you know, we're not using public blockchains, we'll never use public blockchains, it's all about private blockchains, we want to have control. That has changed a lot in the last six months to a year where we're finally starting to hear these financial institutions say things like, we understand public blockchains are the future, but you know, we're just not there yet. So what we want to do is we want to provide them with infrastructure so they can use a public blockchain today, and then when it's time to migrate to a public blockchain, it's very, very easy and seamless for them to do so. And so again, talk about our five key pillars, governance, identity, compliance, confidentiality, and settlement and some key design principles uh, that we have for Polynesh Private Controlled Access, native first, again, remember, no smart contracts to create and manage assets, ultimate flexibility, so a bank can actually take Polynesh Private, put it in their own infrastructure, and decide the rules that they want for their own uh, technology, and then a simplified integration. Remember, no smart contracts, API-driven, with extensive developer tooling. And so here's a bit about our team. We've got a leading Rust expert, the creator of ERC-1400, and the cryptographer behind the world's first account-based privacy-preserving cryptographic protocol. So very, very exciting. You know, it's been great to work with this team over the last few years, uh, working on uh, PolyMesh and now PolyMesh Private. And so uh, that's kind of the end here. I, I hope, you know, maybe we answered the question. You know, I think permissioned infrastructure that's API-driven, not smart contract-driven, is the way to go. That's how we unlock tokenization's potential. Uh, you can scan the QR code if it works up there. Hopefully it does. Um, we also have a booth downstairs. We'll be there all three days. Come say hi. Come have a meeting with us. But yeah, let's, uh, let's move beyond experimentation and go private with PolyMesh. Thanks.